let's go into tree stables tree stables they are we are testing our algorithm for logical errors so you get to examine the algorithm line by line to see if it's doing what it's supposed to do think of that think of our tree stable as like a um a checklist not like a checklist but a real-time check of what is supposed to happen so you know like when you have to go somewhere you have to check to make sure you have your phone check to make sure you have your keys and because of covid you have to check to make sure you have your mask and if each one of them is not you know lined up in the correct place and you don't and you have each one of them se separate then you have a problem right so a trace table is a way to check the algorithm to see if there is a problem because remember our algorithm is supposed to accomplish a particular task and if it's not accomplish any particular task when you run the program it will like you know be bad and you'll probably yeah so it'll probably be like that if you run the um the program and it didn't work but a trace table saves you that headache as I said, fate, no intro. Um, we three weeks are not going live, and I forget about the intro already. Yes, wow. Christmas, huh? Christmas was nice. Christmas was nice. <laughs> All right. So three tables are uh, done with three. Um, three of your control structures. First one is sequential. Next one is selection, and the next one is looping. Right. So we're going through the first one, which is sequential. So follow me as I go through this. So with a trace table, you would have an algorithm. So this is the algorithm here on the right hand side. And with this algorithm, we want to check through everything that has taken place. So this algorithm is saying set x as 5. So this first one here is executed by setting x as 5. Tick. Good. Great. Wonderful. That means you power 5. When you're doing a trace table, what you want to do, you always want to lay out all the variables that you have available in the algorithm. So you have a X, you have a Y, we have a Z, and we have a K. That's what we see in this algorithm here. So you create a table to track every variable. You want to track the changes that take place in every one of them. It's kind of like tracking somebody's, um, tracking somebody's diet or tracking somebody's movements or tracking whatever. You're literally tracking the variables that you put into the program. So we have x is equal to 5, so we track it and we put x is 5. That's the first step because this is step 1. Then we have step 2, which is y is equal to 10. So we track that and we put in step 2 that y becomes 10. Tick. Yay. Next one is z is equal to 15. So this is the third step. So we put z is equal to 15. Tick. Yay. Those are easy because all you have to do is put the value in the correct column now when we reach the number four step four step four says take what is in x and put it inside k that's what the arrow means so we have to start by looking at okay what is in x x has the number five so i'm going to take the number five because that is what in x what is in x and take it and put it inside k so now k will end up being a five according to step four so we do step four by taking what is an X and then putting it inside K. So that checks out. Great. Our next step now is to take what is inside Z, which is here, and put it inside Y. What do we have inside Z? At this point in time, Z has 15 in it. So we take the 15 that is inside Z and we're going to put it inside Y at step five. So the 15 goes and updates Y. 15 and step five. Our next step now is to take what is inside K and put it inside Z. What is inside K? K, the last thing that was inside K was a five. So we're going to take this five dollars in K and carry it down and put it inside Z. So now Z is five. So the 15 hours there before no longer holds because we have replaced it with a five. The 10 hours here before no longer holds because we replaced it with a 15. That's the whole point of variables. With variables, they get to change the things that are inside the variable. Our last instruction now is to take Z and put it inside Y. If I take Z and put it inside Y, what I'm going to do is take whatever inside Z here and put it inside Y there. What that means now is that the 15 hours there before no longer applies. 
So our end goal now is to write what is x, y, z, and k. So x will be 5 because that's what we have right here. y will be 5 because the last thing that was put inside y was a 5. And then z would be 5 because the last thing I was putting inside z was a 5. And in k is a 5. So it's 5, 5, 5, 5. Ta da! That is a sequential trace table. The most basic of them all. Highly unlikely that they'll give you this on an exam because this is like a stepping stone. If they do, you should smile. They thank you. And move on with your life. Or watch it and be like, impossible. Sometimes when you watch your, um, your, your exam, you'll be like, whoa, it's too easy. Yeah, it could be like that. What will most likely happen is something like this. A trace table using selection control structures. Now, selection control structures means that you have to make a choice. So let's go through a selection scenario. So for the algorithm, we have interpose price P1. Now, what did I say before? You have to make sure that the variables are accounted for. So the first variable is P1. Make sure P1 is accounted for. Next variable is P2. You have to make sure P2 is accounted for. Great. Wonderful. Now, if we go through the algorithm again, we realize the only other variable that we have is low. So that means we have to account for low. So now that we have the three algorithm, the three, um, let's call it thing, three variables all accounted for, now we can trace what's going to happen. So when it says write interface price, this doesn't matter to us because we do not trace table. We trace in what's happening. Enter second price doesn't matter to us either because we still tracing it's a trace table so we read price one read price two if price one is less than price two then we take what is in price one and put it inside low but remember if statement is a condition so we want to check the condition to see if it is uh, price one is less than price two because the answer is is price one less than price two is 50 less than 45 no the answer is no so therefore we won't do this option we will do this option so we'll take price 2 and put it inside low. So price 2, which is the 45, is going to go here, go down into low. So now the value of low is going to be 45. And therefore, we have traced price 1, price 2, and the result that will happen based on the condition. And that's how selection goes in a trace table. Two more brain cells needed, but I think you got there. I think you got there. Yeah. Now the real way that they usually ask trace tables is using loops. So you need to understand loops. This is video eight of eight. So you may want to go back to video. If you do, if, if what I do next confuses you, you may want to go back to video four, five and six. Yeah, four, five, and six, that's where we where I did loops and explain everything about loops. But I'll still explain it because this will help you understand loops a little more. Dun 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 Ta-da! Looks confusing. No, it's not. Let's start by doing the basic things. Well, the first thing you have to do when you, when you have a trace table, you have to lay out the variables that you plan to use. So the first variable that you're going to see there is sum, and you see number. So, put sum inside here put number there right those are variables because we are tracing so we want to track what is happening with the variables right that's the whole goal track what is taking place then we have four counter is equal to one to five counter is considered a variable because well it changes it counts from one to whatever in this case we count it from one to five so counter will go here now because i know it's a for loop more than likely it's going to count sequentially so i could put counter on one two three four five but i don't need to put it as yet I'll put that every time the loop runs. It says write enter number. We don't really worry about that because in a trace table, you don't care about the prompts. You don't care about what is said and all them kind of things. Sometimes you have to you have to care based on what is printed out. But usually what the um, the computer prompts, you don't really have to put that in a trace table. What you're really concerned the most about is the variable that you have and how that variable is going to change. So when it says read number, number is the variable. So we're not concerned about the actual read. What we're concerned about is the number that we actually get from the user. 
the number that we get from the user in this case is assume the user puts in 5, 4, 11, 7 or 8, right? So that means the first number they put in is a 5. So let's go to the trace table part now. <clears throat> Sum is equal to 0, number is equal to 0. We are counting for that here and here. Alright, they specifically said set the sum to 0, set the number to 0. Who are we to complain? We are not going to say no, right? Four counter is one to five. What that means is we're going to go from one, starting at one for counter. Enter number, read number. What's the first number reading? The first number reading is the five. You can see the five down here, right? Five down here. First number. So five comes in as number. Our next instruction says take the sum and add it to the number. What is the current sum? The current sum is zero. That's the last thing we know about our sum, the zero. So we're going to take the zero and add it to the number zero plus five. Zero plus five is going to give you five. ta -da! So now sum goes up to five because of this here. What we're really doing is we're tracking. We are tracking what happens with sum. If you didn't understand that, that's okay. You will realize there's a pattern that repeats because it's a loop. And because it's looping, it will just keep doing that over and over. If you understood that so far, you smart. You very smart. And we continue. Let's go. So the loop will go a second time. So the for loop is going to try to go from one to two. Remember, so if you don't understand how, how this for loop is working, go back to video number four in this playlist. You should be okay, right? So number two, four counter is two, right? Enter number. The number that we read is an four. So now our job is to we took note of before because before right down here they told us what numbers are coming in. Those numbers come in, and then our job is now take that number, which is 4, and add it to the sum. The current sum that we own now is 5, so it's 5 plus 4. 5 and 4 will give you 9. So 5 plus 4 gives you 9. So now we've reached that point. This is the second time the loop has run. Great. Third time the loop is going to run now, we're going to get the number 11. So you see the number 11 comes here. So the number is 11. So now it's going to be number is... I'm going to clean this up so you can see what's actually happening. So you'll see 11 here added to the previous sum, which is 9, because that's the last sum that we have over there, 9. So 9 plus 11 is going to give me 20. Ta-da! As the third loop, the fourth loop now, we're going to get the number 7. We get the number 7. 20 plus 7 is 27. Yeah! And then the last number that we're going to get is a 8, which will be this 8 here. 27 plus 8 will give me 55 and then I have successfully navigated the loop and traced what happened every single time the loop ran. I think I've just educated you. Does anybody have any questions? In the chat, if you have any questions, you could ask now. So let's see what this trace table here will look like. So we have x is equal to 0, y is equal to 1. And then we have 4x is equal to 1 to 6 to add 1 to x or add 1 to y. This is what will happen. Why this will happen? Let's go. x is equal to 0, y is equal to 1. So we set those two values at the start. x is equal to 0. Then 4x is 1 to 6. Dun, 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 dun. We start x at 1. 
And then we should have x is equal to x plus 1. So that means x is going to go up to 2. And then we have y is equal to y plus 1. So that means y is going to go up to 2 because 1 plus 1 will be 2. And this will repeat again. Um, x will be 3. 3 goes up to 4. And then 3 goes up to 4. 4 goes up to 5. 4 goes up to 5. 5 goes up to 6. 6 goes up to 7. Because all you're doing is every time you loop, you're adding 1 to the number. So that's basically what would happen. Pretty much. And these are the kind of questions that they ask for, for CX. These are the questions they ask, they ask it for CSEC IT. That's what I'm saying here. Yeah. yeah, I have some sample questions here, but we really have time to go through all of that. But you should have seen the fundamentals of trace tables here if you have any questions. You can leave them in the comments. What is going on here, Ronaldo? So random question. Do you ever do you ever use AdMats in real life? Hold on, eh? We'll just finish this. Right, so that's it for Trace Tables. This is the end of the algorithm series. And check the playlist link in the description. You're welcome. Thanks for watching the video. I hope it helped you a lot. If you're looking for quality information technology, and computer science classes at the Cape level, you can check us out, Make It Simple TT at one 808 8799 or you can check us online at makeitsimplett.com for slash register and use all of our free resources. But if you're looking for a class that has recordings and explanations for every single thing that you need to do in the whole syllabus, you can check us out.